in the rest of Rome, Rome about 11 through 16, in, in chapter 6. I don't think we have to go each and every, each and every verse. We can, we can go by what these scriptures say and how they tie into what we're talking about here. So that's what a real redemption and release from bondage is about. Not about the filthy rags and the wretched man and the sin every day and everybody's going to mess up. Even those that, are, that say they're arguing for holiness and righteousness, they still say, but, but you're going to mess up. You shouldn't sin. It's bad to sin. It's horrible, but you're going to sin. And you got the magic blood to keep you covered. No, you're trampling the blood. We're going to do a whole lesson on what it means to trample the blood and insult the spirit of grace. And how that fits into people that are genuinely were saved and people that coming out of this mess that have never been really saved to begin with. See, another problem, another major problem with this is equating all sin is the same. See, they don't understand the nature of man, the nature of sin, and the nature of God, and how it all connects together in the synergistic relationship of man working together with God. It's been preached in the mon monogist monogism for so long that God does everything, and you just sit and wait for him to change your desires from naughty to nice, although it never really happens unless you want it to happen, or make your unwillingness into willingness magically somehow. So that you might be able to stop sinning, but you can't. Well, everybody, nobody ever does. And when we're talking about sin, we're talking about the most vile sins, okay? Make that clear, too. I'm always talking about the most vile sins, like listed in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The fornication, the adultery, the drunkenness, the uncleanness, the filthiness, all those things. That's the type of sins they're talking about. When you're talking about everybody messes up. They're talking about it, they get messed up. They go out and get drunk. They get messed up. They go out and fornicate. They get messed up. They go back to their filth online. That's the reason you got all the focus groups and 12-step programs that do nothing, like I said, but magnify the false gospel. That's why they're bad. There's nothing good about them. They magnify the false gospel. Just like your activities that you participate in that are more wholesome than the worldly activities after gambling and drinking. Well, yeah, they might be more wholesome with a better class of people, but are they really focused on God? Is anybody really in those activities really interested in focusing on God? I don't think so. I've been to those Christian camps. I've been to those Christian retreats in the past. Nobody wants to sit down and dig into the scriptures. Nobody wants to spend a couple of hours at the picnic table there digging into the Bible and talking about God. They're too busy playing. It's because the focus is not on God. It's just a form of godliness. It's just a pretense that, oh, it's a little bit better activity than going out and getting drunk with the boys. But see, it's still, it's, it's no good. It's the same thing as the focus groups talking about your addictions and thinking that gives you a, a benefit of some sort when all it does is magnify the false gospel that you're saved in that horrible condition. And God is so, feels sorry for you, and someday maybe you'll be able to break that addiction. No, you'll never be able to break it until you put it to death in repentance. And that's going to be a painful experience for you, folks. So let's get back to this, the nature of sin. The Bible teaches that not all sins are the same. Okay? First of all, it teaches sin is transgression of the law First, in 1 John 3, 4. You have to have knowledge of the law before you can transgress the law. Sin is transgression of the law. A little baby child cannot be a sinner, born a sinner, because there's no knowledge of right and wrong, as the scriptures so clearly point out so many times. So, having no knowledge of good or evil, there cannot be a transgression of the law. I was alive once without the law, but when the law came, you know, then he transgressed and he died, Romans 7, 9, where he, where he talks about that. So I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What's he talking about? Well, again, like Deuteronomy 139, your little ones that have no knowledge of right and wrong. But when they do, then sin is transgression of the law, the moral codes, knowing to do what's right and not doing it. The law of conscience, like the, the uh, Gentiles, by nature, doing what's 
what uh, is contained in the law. Romans 2.14, where he says, By nature, they do the things contained in the law. Whether their conscience either accusing. He says, the Gentiles who have, the, who, they don't have the law of Moses, but they by nature, see, by progression, see, nature is physis, it's a progression of growth, it's not anything that dwells in your, in your flesh. By nature, they do the things contained in the law. Showing that the law is written in their conscience. See, written, written on their conscience, like, for, like John 1, 9 says, that light that was in every man that comes into the world. So it bears witness in themselves, in their thoughts, either accusing or excusing them. And every man has that light of conscience, as, as we'll go on to show you here. So... That's the definition of sin in the scriptures. So temptation is not sin. A fleeting thought running across your mind is not sin, unless you indulge it. Like James says, you're, you're drawn away and enticed by your own desires and lusts, and then taken captive by them, and then it gives birth to sin when sin is full grown, brings forth death. Yeah, that's what happens to you. It's your own, you're drawn away by your own desires. Not by something indwelling. Not by some mysterious nature. Your own passions and desires, you never crucified. That's the problem here. These people that think they can confess their sins under the blood all day long. So sin's transgression of a known precept, commandment, natural law. So we just talked about in Romans 2, 14 and 15. But there are sins unto death and sins not unto death. 1 John 5, 16. He's saying there's sins unto death and there's sins not unto death. So there's two types. There's a sin that leads them instantly to death. Fornication, adultery, drunkenness. One act is death. I mean, you can't, you can't be the prodigal son over and over and over, like so many of these people think. Well, I was the prodigal son. Many. No, the prodigal son was the prodigal son one time. Then he came to himself. He reasoned with him, within himself. If I return to the Father and cast myself before him for reconciliation, perhaps... He will grant me that reconciliation. And surely God, he says, he will abundantly pardon. Back to the Isaiah 55 verse, right? If you forsake those things, if you come to him and turn to him, then he will abundantly pardon. That's why the, the father ran out to greet him in, in that story. So there's sins unto death and sins not unto death. Now, do we need to go into a vast discussion about sins not unto death? Well, then we're going to get into accused of, well, do you sin? Is this sin? Is that sin? See, I'm not here to argue about every little thing about jaywalking or a traffic light or going over the speed limit. It's ridiculous, okay? Use, like the Gentiles says there, the Gentiles there, by nature, they do the things contained in the law, their conscience. If your conscience is going to accuse you of wrongdoing or excuse you of that wrongdoing. You see what I'm saying? So, use your reasoning intellect there, folks. In John 19, 11, when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, and he was talking about the being handed over, and they were talking about sin, and Jesus said, well, he, those that handed me over to you that bared fault witness are guilty of the greater sin. So there's a greater sin, there's a worser sin. How much worse punishment do you suppose he will be thought worthy? So, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? See, there's a greater sin, a greater degree of condemnation because of the degree of light is greater. That's the important thing to know here. And, of course, there's eternal sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, a well, total rejection of the Holy Spirit's conviction. And that's what many... Many people are in danger of doing because they've rejected like, over and over again the light and the truth of God in the Holy Spirit's conviction and they fall into unbelief and then hardness and then can't and then not able to find repentance. So basically sin transgression of your known known precept of the law, your known conscience. Sins unto death and not unto death. Greater sin and eternal sin. And then that degree of light that I wanted to mention to you. In the Luke 
12, verse 47 and 48 scripture, where it talked about the fewer or the many stripes rendered those that knew the Master's will and didn't know the Master's will as clearly. See, the subject of those things has been understood because many think that ignorance of the divine precepts is sufficient excuse for their crimes and that they might just have a few stripes and still make it in under the wire. You know, the thief on the cross nonsense. So they voluntarily continue in their ignorance, but such persons should know that God will judge them for the knowledge that they might have received. See, you have plenty of time to receive that light, but refuse to acquire. See, no criminal is ever excused because he's been ignorant of the laws of his country and so transgressed them. Tell, tell the cop that, well, I didn't know. You know I ran a traffic light. I didn't know it was against the law to run a traffic light. See, it's ridiculous, right? Totally. Same with God. Especially when it can be proved that those laws have been published throughout the land. See, much knowledge is a dangerous thing, if not improved upon. As will greatly aggravate the condemnation of the person that has that knowledge. Nor will it avail a person in the land of light and information to be ignorant, as he shall be judged for what he might have known. And perhaps in this case like in the Luke scripture, the punishment of his voluntary ignorance, but even greater because of the more enlightened enlightenment that he could have gained. Because the crimes are so aggravated by this consideration that he refused to have the light that he might neither be obliged to walk in that light nor be accounted for the possession of it. So the plea of ignorance is just a refuge of lies. And nobody can plead it in the land where God is within reach. Call upon God while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. His hand is outstretched. And lives in a country that's blessed with the preaching of the gospel message and access to the word of God. See, that's the key here. So no one's pleading ignorance in the face of God. Why well, didn't know? Or it was under the blood. If I say I have no sin. See, all these things are just excuses that were made up in theological minds over, the, over the, the, the centuries and been handed down as a legacy to now where we have a lawless generation on our hands. And we have so few that are coming to a real knowledge of the truth. And even those that come to a knowledge of the truth are getting hung up in all different avenues down the different rabbit trails out there. You got to do this, and you got to do that. You got to eat this meat, and you got to keep that day, and you got to keep this ceremony, wear, wear this head covering, and, and on and on and on it goes. What we need is sound, fundamental, centered teaching of a repentance message to this generation, a clarion call to obedience from your heart to God, which is your reasonable service to Him without hypocrisy without guile, without treachery in your heart. And that's going to be the essence of this Bible study as we proceed on. Now we'll move into the next lesson.